Thank you so much, all of you. I know that most of you know about the big mobilization. You can see one of the largest uh, protests that happened at uh, Delhi's India Gate so around December 20th and 21st of 2012. That was after this gang rape of this young woman in uh, Delhi that subsequently resulted in her death. I just want to share with you some thoughts because if I look back at our involvement in that movement, there are several things uh, that one can talk about now, one can see, and one can look at the impact it's had, uh, both good and bad, and assess all of that. So I'd just like to share some thoughts in the backdrop of that and hope that it's useful for those of you who are organizing here against uh, violence against women. I'd like to start, uh, however, by talking about how not to talk about rape in India. Because generally the way in which the international media has uh, uh, talked about uh, the incidences of rape in India uh, has been extremely problematic. Recently, after this instance of the two uh, young girls who were raped and strung up from a tree, uh, killed and strung up from a tree, so they, I got calls from various uh, media people, and one of them was from the BBC in London for a radio program, so I couldn't really hear exactly who she was speaking to, the anchor, but uh, for somebody from the British Foreign Secretary's office. So uh, they spoke to her before they spoke to me. And the way the entire program was uh, organized was that it was about this incident in, De in India, another incident, I think, of an honor killing in Pakistan, and another incident, a third incident of a really uh, horrendous violence against women in Sudan. So it talked about India, Pakistan, Sudan. That was the grouping. And it started by saying, let's, let's talk about uh, you know, the problems that women face in some parts of the world, as though it's only in those parts of the world that those problems are faced. And then this anchor asked this woman who was from the Foreign Secretary's office about, uh, would, you, would you discontinue aid to these countries? Because, yeah. So, um, well, after they got back to me, uh, when she got back to me, uh, the anchor, the first thing, I mean, I was trying very hard not to be incoherent with rage, of course, but, uh, but uh, you know, I tried to tell her that, you know, how come you're able to group Pakist India, Pakistan, and Sudan together? Why not group India, Pakistan, and California together? Or uh, India, you know, India, Pakistan, Sudan, and California together, or something like that. Clearly, it's because then you can't ask somebody you, uh, in, uh, uh, Br in the British government, oh, uh, would you discontinue aid to America? Would you stop taking aid from America? You can't do that. So clearly that grouping, you know, including California and that would uh, sort of screw up your, uh, your, your, un your, your neat picture of, uh, uh, you know, uh, violence against women in certain parts of the world being a sort of uh, white person's burden, white government's burden. And that's the whole problem. Then of course I also talked about, uh, you know, what's British aid and what kind of violence it is you know, complicit with, which I'll come to later. Uh, but one of the really encouraging things I'm seeing uh, lately has been the give and take and the sharing uh, and the solidarity is not only between movements, but also the kind of resonance that certain, you know, certain individuals who've been writing uh, have had across countries. For instance, very recently there was an article, and I'll recommend it to all of you because it's a very powerful writing, by someone called Estelle uh, Tang. I think she's from Melbourne, and she now lives in New York. So she's written something called an open letter to her, uh, open letter to my male friends. Have, has any of you come across it? Yeah, some of you have. Yeah, so do, do read it definitely because it's a very powerful piece, very, very simply written. And she writes about the daily experience of sexual harassment on the streets that she faces in New York. And she talks about how it may have been worse than what she faced in Melbourne, but how her friends in Australia also do face catcalling and so on. But she talks about how it is constant in America. And for me, that was an eye-opener. And also, uh, you know, for people reading in India, you know, you could have just substituted New York with Delhi in each of those instances or any so many Indian cities, and it would have been the same. Constant harassment, and you have to think every time, how do I respond to this? In India, very often, you're asked, oh, why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you file a complaint? And Estelle Tang addresses this. She said, you know, if I were to do this, I would be doing little else all day. It would be, I'd have a much shorter and much more annoying day because I'd be doing uh, nothing else. There would be so many instances of this. Then she also writes about uh, so how, how, how our decision has to be made every single time. How do I respond? Will I ignore it? And she says about 
you know, ignoring it in the context of the California incident, she talks about the fact that, I'll just read out, she says, every time a man whistles me up on the street murmuring that I'm gorgeous or sexy, I ignore him. Doesn't that mean that I'm rejecting him too? Could I be in the same kind of danger one day at the receiving end of some Elliot Rogers who thinks that he has to take revenge against women who are rejecting him? And of course she goes on to say uh, to her men friends that I know you may not be the guys who are doing this out there. I'm not trying to hold you responsible for all of that. I'm just trying to explain to you what it is like to be a woman. And she also says I'm not asking you to become my personal vigilante force either or anything like that. Which is also important because a lot of men in the Indian context do feel they have to do that. That they have to be these protective uh, men running to the rescue of women. So, so much of this resonated, where you didn't have to keep thinking about, oh, this is India. You could, act, or, you know, the, you could talk about uh, what is similar between India and New York and uh, how women tackle this daily, and more about what's common and what's shared in our experience of violence rather than uh, what is you know, unique and exotic to India. That said, of course, we in India would be very, very uh, conscious of what are the specific coordinates of misogyny and patriarchy in India, what is, uh, how is it structural in India in a specific way. It isn't enough to say it is rooted in uh, uh, patriarchy or capitalism or whatever. You do need to understand exactly how it is rooted in Indian society and um, how do we fight it there. So we have to understand how caste works in India and uh, how uh, gender and uh, class are interwoven with caste in order to structure Indian society. So we did uh, a lot of that. I just wanted to share something in the context of our experience of 2012 and 2013 in India. In the context of the discussion and the debate which was mentioned here about what's going on in Australia, some of the discussions and debates you've been having here, I was thinking about some groups on the left feeling that maybe reclaim the night marches, things of that kind, would tend to focus on uh, demanding greater policing or more uh, CCTV cameras and so on. And uh, be sure that's the case even in India. A large number of the protesters last year were actually asking for the death penalty for rape. Uh, in a sense, many of them were not really thinking about what the death penalty means. They were simply saying we are sick of rapists getting away with violence and so they were, uh, they were angry against impunity. And death penalty is there in the Indian law, it is the highest punishment, so they were asking for that. Of course, there were others who were also, you know, kind of really obsessed with the idea of a severe punishment and death penalty and what, what, what and so have you. And of course, the, the state also tried to push the idea of CCTV cameras and so on. How did we respond to that when we were part of this movement? First thing we did was, in the movement of which we were a part, was to uh, try and find a slogan that would resonate with people, which would say some of what the movement itself was saying, but which would take things away from the single-minded focus on the death penalty. Because we noticed that while there were many, many people, many thousands of people uh, are, you know, with these death penalty play cards, there were also many thousands of first-time protesters with no exposure whatsoever to the women's movement or the left movement or anything like that, who had play cards against victim blaming, which was not in the context of that specific horrific rape, but which was more general. It was about saying, don't tell us what kind of clothes we should be wearing, don't tell women what to wear, tell men not to rape, tell men how to behave. They were persuasive and angry, play cards, posters, so creative, so many of them, including some by men. We saw one boy uh, painting a poster and holding it up on his own, in which he said, uh, we men can wear shirts which show off our biceps and nobody is going to tell us you are in danger of being raped. So he, he tried to think about, you know, uh, the fact that clothes have nothing to do with rape. So there was all this happening and there was tremendous anger against every victim blaming remark that politicians across the board were doing. We've had a minister in BGP government in Madhya Pradesh just now say something about how some rapes are right and some rapes are wrong. And, you know, this is also pretty common. You have uh, US senators doing it, you have Tony Abbott doing it, you have so many people doing it. So what we did was try and see what would resonate with, what would help to sort of bring into focus this aspect of the protest. And one of the slogans that sort of happened out here in the middle of this, where it was difficult to hear yourself think, the only slogan around was the death penalty slogan, nothing else. So when we went there, it was difficult to open your mouth and say anything else because it, you couldn't hear or th yourself think for a while. But then some uh, young women started raising the slogan of women want freedom. And then they would do variations on that. Women want freedom to study, freedom to go to college, freedom on the streets, freedom on the buses, freedom on the trains. And then it started off into you know, freedom from the uh, caste panchayats, the caste bodies that 
uh, do honor killings in India. Very soon we found that we were saying freedom from the carps, that is, uh, carps are these caste bodies. And there were girls responding, absolutely first time protesters, hundreds of them, responding with freedom from Baap, which means father. So Baap se bhi azadi, bhai se bhi azadi, you know, freedom from our brothers, freedom from our fathers, things like that. And then we could, after a whole uh, lot of that, we found that if we started to speak, people would stop and listen. And then we would talk about the different contexts in which rape happens and how your outrage is happening against this incident in Delhi. Uh, and one incident uh, which, which has enraged you so much, but uh, you know, th think about the rapes which you don't even hear about, because here at least the media is here, the media is talking about it day in and day out, uh, when Dalit women are raped, oppressed caste women are raped because they are Dalit, or when Kashmiri women or women from the northeast of India are raped by the army, or women in central India of Chhattisgarh are raped by the police in police custody, you don't even get to hear about it. So we would, we had posters with the, uh, about these incidences also, so we talked about that. And one of the slogans that really became really popular was about women's liberation being linked up with everybody's liberation. The slogan was Nari Mukti Sabki Mukti, which means women's liberation, everybody's liberation. So people would, uh, you know, shout both slogans first. They would say Nari Mukti Sabki Mukti and then they would say Sabki Mukti Nari Mukti. Lots of slogans like that, which are, uh, which have been part of the women's movement and the left movement especially. But suddenly they had this much wider resonance. And there are three women researchers in Mumbai who have written a book not about this movement. In fact, I read the book after the first few months of this movement and suddenly found that it resonated so much. It could have been the manifesto for much of what we were doing uh, in Delhi. Uh, it was a, it's a book called Why Loiter? And if anybody is interested in looking for an interesting book about violence against women in India, that's an interesting book to read. It's not the usual thing that you'll find. It's not chock, flock, chock full of sh uh, shocking statistics. It is actually uh, talking about Mumbai, which is supposed to be a safer city generally and talking about what it is uh, that women feel what makes women vulnerable in public spaces even in a city like Mumbai these women in an interview I noticed that a couple of them had studied on an American campus so one of them uh, you know talking about the differences between say America and India said that well uh, I was actually probably closest to being in danger of violence myself on the American campus because uh, there was a serial rapist out on the loose and he hadn't been caught and uh, there was a very real danger, they're very close to uh, the bone. But she said that uh, in India it's different. In India, the kind of uh, uh, concern which occupies a large part of women's minds, you know, across classes in India, in public spaces is, and in, uh, even in your family environment, in your community and so on, is the pressure to appear respectable. Because you are asked to justify your presence, in, especially in public spaces. You are asked to justify why you're out here. Do you have a reason to be out here? How are you dressed? Who are you with? In their book, they talk about instances of girls coming home with a boyfriend, uh, but they won't get the, uh, they won't, you know, the boyfriend may be ready to walk with her uh, until the, until her, the gate of her house, because the last stretch near her house may be dark and may be unsafe. But she'll say no, because she'll say, she'll feel that then her family will see, her community will see, her neighbors will see, and then they will comment on her character. In this book, there's a passage about how they frame the question of women's right to loiter, to do nothing in public space without answering, but not only women's rights. Then they also extended it to the rights of, they talked about the ways in which the police often profiles um, uh, working class men, poor unemployed working class men who are out on the public street, just their very presence means that they are some kind of source of danger. So they are profiled, Muslim men are profiled and so on. This is the passage. It is only when the city belongs to everyone that it can ever belong to all women. The unconditional claim to public space will only be possible when all women and all men can walk the streets without being compelled to demonstrate purpose or respectability. For women's access to public space is fundamentally linked to the access of all citizens. Equally crucially, we feel the litmus test of this right to public space is the right to loiter, especially for women across classes. Loiter without purpose or meaning, loiter without being asked what time of day it was, why we were there, what we were wearing and whom we were with. So um, this was some of what we were doing in uh, the movement in Delhi as well. Uh, talking about uh, how to expand the spaces. So even when we were talking about violence in public spaces or the sense of constraint that women feel in public spaces, we were talking about the need to safeguard women's freedom without fear. 
Um, this phrase sort of happened in a speech that I gave on December 18th at the house of the Delhi chief minister. And uh, I didn't even know that somebody had done a video recording of the speech and uploaded it. The speech had gone viral. There are more than 50,000 views of that speech now, I think. And uh, it, it went viral and it resonated huge. I started getting messages from young women saying, thank you for saying what you did. The thing that they connected with was that I had talked about the fact that we don't want to hear this word protection, that women want protection, because in the name of protection, immediately what happens is that women's own freedoms are taken away. Especially in India, this is very much a problem, where families will immediately tighten up, uh, you know, hostels uh, will tighten up on curfews, families will say, oh, we, we won't send you out to study to another city, and so on and so forth. You lose your freedoms every time the threat of violence uh, appears in front of you. I've said in that speech that we don't want you to take away our freedom in the name of protecting us, we want you to protect our freedom without fear. And then we talked about the freedom without fear of so many other communities, the right of people to be, to, to be free as free citizens without experiencing uh, the fear of profiling or the, any other kind of fear, fear of violence. How did we talk about the police and so on? Because yes, that did occupy a large part of uh, the demands that we put forward. We tried to see it as an issue of how to make the state accountable. For instance, if one says that the state has to be accountable to ensuring that workers uh, get better wages, I don't think we would be seen as being complicit with the state, would we? But then uh, why is it that if we say the state should construct more shelters or the state's, or the state's police should be accountable, that we should know how it's functioning and we, we, it should be able to show us that it is functioning in the way we would like it to. So in fact, when people started talking about CCTV cameras, we said we don't need CCTV anywhere except in the police stations. We do need them there. Yeah, it, it was serious. I was, it was actually serious. It was very seriously put forward in a charter of demands that the, uh, that the movement, movement adopted, saying that uh, the, we, 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 we want to know what the police, are they registering complaints immediately or are they sending women away or, uh, you know, we've had police men making comments about women's, how they're dressed and say, you know, themselves sexually harassing uh, rape survivors who've come in to file complaints. Among other things, when one talked about freedom in India, the thing that we needed to talk about then was the caste structure and the caste system. Because patriarchy is really deeply interwoven with caste in India. And caste is not some cultural thing out there. Caste is very much a material reality because caste is the way in which certain sections of laborers are fixed to certain kinds of labor. So very largely you will find that the uh, sanitation work, which is, I'm just giving you one instance, the most obvious instance, which is that sanitation work, which is the dirtiest job, and which in India still involves a whole lot of manual cleaning of excreta, which is supposedly illegal, but it survives in various forms. Uh, this is largely done by the uh, so-called untouchable Dalit caste. The caste structure is still uh, very much a part of organizing labor in India, organizing workers in India. Uh, there's no running away from that, although of course you may find workers from upper castes as well. Uh, there's, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that's not the case, but I'm saying that uh, one can't understand caste without understanding it in the context of labor. And uh, if you look at how uh, patriarchies operate, uh, there's a great deal of anxiety about maintaining the caste integrity. And you can't do that without ensuring that then the norms of who you're allowed to marry are maintained. And so that inevitably ensures that you have to control uh, who women are allowed to have relationships with and who they're allowed to marry. So control on women's sexuality and reproduction. In, an, in addition, of course, to the fact that then it is also tied up, this caste hegemony will also be tied up with, her, with land relations. A dominant community, for instance, in Haryana next to Delhi would be under strain now because there are greater claims on the land by other communities as well. Now women have finally secured the right to inherit ancestral property. It happened quite late in the day, I think in the very late 90s, but it has happened now. Now these forces, they are represented by these caste panchayats, these khap panchayats, are deeply opposed. They've led campaigns against and they have even gotten ruling parties in state governments to pass laws in their state assemblies depriving women of their right to inherit property. It's another thing that these have not become law in India because the uh, president didn't give assent to these laws, but the very fact that they commanded that much political support to be able to get those laws passed in Punjab and Haryana, uh, this happened. Now why do they do that? Uh, uh, why, how is that linked to say honor killings and caste? Uh, because they realize that if the woman marries 
either outside the caste or even uh, of her own choice you know some it could be within the same community but it's of her own choice when she's made that choice she is much more likely to then claim her share of the land which is inherited which is ancestral and that that will mean a division of the land that will mean an erosion of their control of a small section of people who do control the land uh, so they don't want women making any claims on this they control the young men and since there's so much unemployment the young men are dependent on the older people who do control the land they actually uh, use uh, some of those young men to conduct these honor killings what i'm trying to say is that even something like honor killings in the indian context i'm sure it's the same in other parts of the world should not be seen as something that is a cultural thing alone it is uh, structural i'm not saying that in a very easy causative kind of fashion but the point is that you can't resist it and you can't fight it without understanding it as part of the uh, kinds of social and economic relations in that uh, in in wherever it is and so when the slogan of uh, freedom therefore actually hit very hard also at uh, at the at the at, at the attempts to control uh, women in their private space so you see it was a slogan being raised in the context of freedom on the streets but then it very soon became about freedom from the father freedom from the brother freedom from this control inside the home freedom from being told who you can marry and who you can't or whether you should marry or you should not i mean all of that so this division between the violence in the private sphere and violence in the public sphere was also broken by this slogan which united both and which could talk about both and which quickly brought the spotlight back into the kinds of uh, control and i'm not saying that everybody for instance a lot of the youngsters who were participating in these huge mobilizations would raise the slogans young men and then would come up later and i've had these conversations with several of them there one of them i'll tell you who came down and sat and said um i raised these slogans but i'm really worried that if my sister wants this kind of freedom won't it make her more insecure and then of course we talked about the fact that actually he was feeling insecure and he did he did admit that he said yes it's true what if she marries outside the community what will happen and what if he doesn't treat her right i said yes but what if she marries in the community and he doesn't treat her right what would that be would you know you would have thought okay problem solved she's married but you know clearly it wouldn't be how would you deal with that so we talked all this out i asked him at the end of that conversation this particular young man did you ever think about any of this before before this movement and he said no it never occurred to me i never thought about my sister and myself and how differently we are treated in the family because his first question to me was if she behaves the way i do won't she be in greater danger yeah so so you know so i said that well great that you, uh, you know at least there was this crack this chink in the way in which in 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 the citadel of uh, patriarchal ideology <laughs> and thinking where you know you feel, the things that in which uh, people felt comfortable it suddenly started feeling uncomfortable and gritty the skin of patriarchy suddenly wasn't sitting so comfortably anymore and so that's fine that's great so we can't be responsible for everything in the movement and we can't be responsible for everything the state does one last thing which i'd like to address but in the indian context often this question comes up that uh, okay so there's all these feudal survivals and these uh, you know these ideas about uh, you know of our how women should behave and so on so what are you when you say freedom what kind of freedom are you this has been asked even by some of our comrades as well are you talking about that westernized freedom and of course if it's someone on the left they'll be asking oh uh, you know capitalist freedom is that what one is talking about Uh, the freedom of the market it's interesting because capitalism as marx has always recognized is something that has a very complex relationship with many things and for instance with patriarchy capitalism is actually of course it's deeply implicated in patriarchy where women are concerned it has conflicting impulses it wants to draw women into the workforce but at the same time it wants to subsidize itself by making women do domestic work and so it is also interested in the domestic discipline of the household and in maintaining that and i think that it's impossible to talk about violence without understanding uh, how violence actually plays out in the context of all of this but one thing i do think about that i've had left theorists in india try to say violence is structural in, in the indian you know kind of feudal context but it's super structural in the advanced capitalist countries and i don't agree i'm just thinking about why all this absurd mis misogynistic remarks by politicians in so many countries you know australia america britain all of that isn't it somewhat to do at least with the fact that you are compelled now to you know impose these austerity measures to cut back on welfare and so on and you then have to re-persuade women to bear burdens which they've been trying to shed and so part of that is about saying good women bad women what happens to bad women what happens to good women good rapes and bad rapes 
and uh, so on and so forth that certainly to understand those those remarks can't just be seen as some loony phenomenon some loony politicians making silly statements they are more than that and they are certainly reflect some of the anxieties ideological anxieties of rulers as well when i think about how, what freedom means i say that yes in india we say the right of a woman the freedom of a woman to wear a skirt to wear jeans without being told oh you're wearing westernized clothing and that's why you asked to be raped of course we were talking about that freedom at the same time we would also think would we not about the fact that even the companies that sell you certain kinds of clothes uh, also will tell you what kind of bodies you need to have in order to wear those kinds of clothes and therefore women even in advanced capitalist societies or women who uh, you know the, the markets don't make you feel freer they make you feel more of uh, more anxious they don't make you feel free and happy in yourself they make you feel anxious about what is wrong with you which you can set right by buying this that or the other or dressing in a certain way certainly one is not saying that uh, freedom equal capitalism the opposite it also doesn't mean that asking for freedom makes you somehow implicated in capitalism not at all we know for instance that workers are less free when they are shackled in certain kinds of feudal or semi feudal bondages are they not i mean india has several of those kinds of bondage that uh, don't allow workers to be entirely free capitalism does set workers free in a nominal sense to be employed by whoever they like at the same time we know the op, you know the other side of that capitalist freedom means that uh, workers uh, are also free from all their uh, or from owning any any means of production whatsoever so it's free in in, in a double sense well women also are then freed in a double sense but we don't ask that uh, therefore it might be safer to keep things the old way and we certainly don't say then that a worker by demanding more rights within capitalism is somehow getting co-opted by capitalism obviously not i think it's perfectly possible to have a larger revolutionary perspective and goal and as part of that to fight for the range of rights of women as democratic uh, dem democratic rights of women as citizens and uh, as uh, as individuals and as people and as and as and as the collective of women and to keep making more demands on uh, the state as well demands that are not restricted only to policing and so forth but also to expand that to say we want and which we've done in india we've actually put on the agenda the demands for safe shelters for women and rape crisis centers and so on a whole range of that there is a uh, imbalance there is also other consequences of this movement uh, in the sense that you also had the this extreme right wing party the uh, party that is in power in india now also playing with the anxieties about violence against women but deploying them to profile the minority uh, one of their allies in tamil nadu uh, used this uh, anxiety to profile the dalit community this is the pattali makkal katchi in tamil nadu which uh, uh, organized violence against dalit uh, against dalit saying dalit men are marrying vanniyar women which is women of the uh, it's, it's an intermediate caste so they said oh their men are marrying our women and so uh, they used an intercaste marriage as a pretext to mobilize violence against the entire dalit community in the same way in muzaffarnagar near delhi you found the bjp using the same khap panchayats the ones that do the honor killings to raise the slogan save our daughters and save our sisters it's the same khap panchayats that kill the daughters and the sisters for marrying who they like but uh, this slogan was raised in order to say that the muslims are conducting a love jihad note the words it's it's linked both with islamophobia which says that every muslim is a potential jihadi but clearly even if the muslim is actually somebody uh, is a young man who may be your your daughter's friend or even if he doesn't have any relationship with your daughter this just, just the fact that he's a muslim young man he can be profiled as a as a source of sexual danger and sexual anxiety and because of our caste and community system in india there's and the and the anxiety that is already there i mean kumkum sangari who's a feminist historian says that patriarchy is a very hospitable space for racism casteism and communalism and actually that's the case and they they played in this very hospitable space to profile the muslim community they had a leader who's a right hand man of the man who's now prime minister making speeches electoral speeches which are on record available on video in which he said the entire muslim community is a community that rapes our mothers and daughters if you want to see them put down you better vote for us and this is you know part of what worked uh, uh, which are the ways in which they tried to consolidate hindus across caste uh, against the muslim community by by playing on these anxieties we are very aware, aware of the fact that the law that we achieved in india slight improvement on the rape law is an improvement in some ways but it is you know uh, several steps back in in some other ways the distinction between consent and non consent which should make the difference between rape and not rape uh, is something which the indian law blurs 
and which uh, this kind of right-wing campaign also blurs, where it is able to conflate consensual relationships with rape and play on uh, you know, gendered and, and uh, patriarchal anxieties about women's increasing autonomy. So we uh, tackled all of that by continuously campaigning with and uh, building solidarities with, building, uh, reaching out to a large uh, section of uh, people, especially women, who are seeking to assert their rights to greater autonomy and freedom.